Welcome to New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union. I'm your host, Sean. You know, sorry about last week, guys. I got really, really busy, and I'm trying to figure out how to make this more entertaining and not so uh, just blasé like everybody else's stuff. Um, Because there's a lot of dudes that have been trying to put out content for in the gun community, especially lately. Um, Because I think it's the only way you can really get in the industry unless you actually, you know, own a business. Um, And your business is guns. Um, I try, I've been trying to break into the 2A industry for a long time to, you know, I have a strong passion for the subject, if you can't tell. Um, So I've been working a lot to try to catch up from being unemployed for two months, basically. Um, Depleted all my savings to get stuff done, and I had some opportunity this last week to work some, and uh, just life got in the way, and I couldn't get back to doing what I normally do on New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union. So what's the good news? Um, Good news is we're winning. Um, I keep saying that, and people keep saying no, we're not. We are. Uh, The Fifth Circuit Court in Texas is upholding the stay, pretty much. Uh, oral argu- arguments are going for the two cases that are there. Um, both re- uh, pertain to the bump stock rule, and it looks like the ATF's about to get dealt with. Um, it's about time. Um, that there's a national injunction, if you're, but it only covers if you're a member of FPC or GOA or you own one of these particular types from certain vendors uh, for pistol braces. Um, that's the good news. Colorado looks like you guys better stock up really, really quick because it looks like they have the votes and the stroke to pass the bans um, that they're trying to do. You know, that this is where we need to step up. We're in the election season. We need to start telling people, um, showing people, especially local politicians, because at the federal level, there's not much you can do. And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense um, in one way. What happens is... If you, the local politicians have a lot of lobbying people that pay for what they do. To get on A and B and C committees, they have to uh, garner certain amounts of funds to pay in to buy into these committees. That's usually paid by lobbyists. Lobbyists usually are large corporations. Um, The A and B committees are the most powerful committees. The C committee is where Veteran Affairs falls. That tells you how much they care about Veteran Affairs. And what these committees do is generate revenue for not only the politician, but for the companies. So if a company has a lobbyist group, they tend to to get farther ahead. So what do I see happening at the federal level? They're going to push it. Um, and, And I honestly think that, you know, at the national level, the best we can do is pick one of the two. Um, If you're going to vote at all at those elections, I would tell you I'm not sure it matters anymore at the national level for the the president. Um, The president can only do so much, and there's a lot of corruption around them. I'm not convinced that either candidate, to be blunt, has the force to do anything good for our country. And I say that because they're surrounded by sycophants that are lobbyists. That means that they're looking out for the corporate dollar. However, at the local elections, what can I see, see, or say and see there? I've seen it locally. You know, locally at the school board, you're seeing pushback because of the stuff that people have been doing with kids. Uh, that's been very public in the federal, well, you know, in the national level. You're seeing those repercussions at the, you know, the school board level. You know, that's how we make this go away is we win the locals over and there's enough locales that actually start making those drops in that bucket bigger. But what I really wanted to get to was, you know, Chinesium. You know, we all know what this is. If you don't, you find a a mount uh, for an optic or an accessory or something. You find one on Amazon and you're like, wow, it looks exactly like the one that I was going to pay 50 bucks more or 100 bucks more. And we've all settled for them. You know, we've all been that guy when we're learning about the 2A. We're trying to do this the best we can, but, you know, we can't really afford some, well, I'm speaking for myself, being a working man again, um, not having the funds to necessarily, you know, buy the best that you can all the time. 
So you settle for one of these devices, whatever it is. Optics are the biggest one. Okay. You know, the old saying goes in the two, and it kind of matters. Uh, buy once, cry once. You know, if you if you buy it multiple times, usually means you didn't get what you wanted the first time, and it didn't have the feature set, or it failed on you. And I've been bitten by that by seeing optics that were, you know, Chinese made, that uh, seemed to be pretty much the same thing as something else. And it was enticing enough because it had the look, the feel, and everything else. I'm not one of those ones that bought a faux Trigicon. I've bought other optics that had the right reticle is what I was more so looking at than the look. Just to get them and find out that they don't work. They don't work the same way. They're not as calibrated as the higher-end one. What I look for nowadays are priced right pieces. You know, Primary Arms is a great optic in my opinion. Um, if you get their medium or upper tier, they're usually good. Um, you, especially with their mounts, I've not had one of their mounts fail. Um, but I've seen a lot of people um, in months past go through training classes and have equipment fail on them. And most of the time when it fails, it's the Chineseium. It's the stuff that we buy that's cheaper and we think it's just as good. And I am no one to, you know, that's the pot calling kettle black is the way I would put it. I've been, you know, done that a lot. Uh, not a lot, but enough to know that there's certain things you stick to that, you know, stick to the rivers and the streams you know is the best way to put it. Um, if it's too cheap to be good, there's probably a reason for it. You know, if it's too cheap, the set, the price is too cheap. Probably need to look at that a little more and see if it actually holds up and does what it's intended to do. What this boils down to is testing. You know, a lot of people, um, especially with the AR-15, and a, some with the Kalashnikov. They'll compromise on one part, one piece, whatever. I've been guilty of that myself. I, I, like I said, I've, this has bought, bit me before. But the screws, the metallurgy is not there uh, for the Chinesium part. Um, if you don't lock down the Chinesium part, it may work as intended. But if you don't lock tight it down, the screws will back out. Because, again, the metallurgy is not there. They usually use harder screws and softer aluminum than other places because they're compromising to make the price uh, attractive to their customers. What that means is you need to be careful about when you torque something down. That's, you know, metal screws, uh, steel screws in aluminum. Um, if you torque it down too much, you're going to strip those threads, and now you have another problem, especially on that really nice rifle or pistol you just bought. Um, that's where Loctite comes in. Use Loctite sparingly, but use it as needed to make sure nothing backs out. And what I'm going towards is, do you train? Do you actually test the stuff you do? And I don't mean just like go out and shoot it, shoot the weapon and see if it has any malfunction. I mean, shoot a couple hundred rounds through it. Roll around in the dirt with it. I'm not talking about drop testing or any, you know, hard testing on it. But seeing if it's going to work long term. You know, I, I one of the biggest things that I've, I am totally against right now, and it's just because I've been raised by boomer parents and boomer shooters, are red dots on pistols. And that's because I really don't see a need for it myself. I've, I've shot them a couple times now. I, I see that they're awesome for new shooters or people that are looking for split times, you know, competition shooters. But for me, as I'm one of those people that just takes my gun out of the safe, puts it on, goes to work, you know, well, can't carry at work, but goes wherever I go that I can carry, I want it to work if I need it to. And to that end, I train. And I test pieces, parts. You know, I still have red dot, not red dots, uh, regular old Trigicon irons on all my pistols that are duty pistols. Um, I want the glow in the dark for night, but that's the only reason why I want it. Um, because my old eyes kind of focus on those three dots and allow me to do some work if I need to. Flashlights, you know, um, having good light. You know, old light has a reputation of just falling apart when you get it on the range and you actually put hundreds of rounds down range, you start seeing the deficiencies it has. Well, this is where you have to do some Google Foo, you know. I've done a lot of Google Foo. Sometimes I listen to it, sometimes I haven't. Has it bitten me? Absolutely. 
because I'm one of those stubborn people that has to see it and use it myself to make a decision on my own. That's where I rely on my testing, my experience. You know, um, that's one of the reasons why I like the Kalashnikov, is because the Kalashnikov is a known quantity for for me, has been for you know, damn near thirty five years or so. Um, I know it very well, and what that means is I know where you can attach things, how you can attach things. Um, and you can tell, per, I can per, tell pretty quickly if it's going to work for me, um, whether or not it's going to have the duty or durability. And what I was talking about with those red dot sites is batteries, man. You know, buying good batteries, Energizer batteries. Um, there's a reason why you buy Energizer or Duracell. There's a reason why um, medical people, law enforcement, they buy the higher end batteries because they last. Because nothing could be more tragic as you pull the tool you need at that one time you need it and it doesn't function or work as well as you need it to because the device you put you stuck staked your life on doesn't work and it blocks those irons so you can't use them as intended and that's why I'm a, I am not a fan of the red dots with pistols it's not that I don't see a utility not that I don't see that the greatness of them. It's more so I don't want that other piece to fail in a time of need. You know, I'm one of those guys that still believes in backup sites on AR-15s one way or another. Um, if you look at like my Wick build, it has a backup set of, well, not a set of irons. It actually has a backup RDS or a, a red dot system. And why I have that there is uh, my other one is prismatic scope but you know stuff fails right and I want to have that red dot I do test it routinely to make sure and I, when I say I test it I take the battery out and I check the voltage on it that's how anal I am about batteries for my optics now I've ran into some issues lately when I've taken my friends out to shoot with old uh, 2032 batteries that just kind of you turn them on and the optic lights up I never use the light unless it's like at night so that's why I haven't tested those as much but the red dots that I do have the red dot uh, systems I have on rifles I test those pretty often because that is the optic right where the other one the prismatic you're just going to have a dark um, reticle instead of a lit up one and I'm okay with a dark reticle as long as the reticle is still there and that's what I'm talking about is, is can you imagine pulling your pistol because you're in that worst day of your life and the dot's dead? And I don't care what anybody says. You testing it, um, checking it like daily, the, op the, the chances of it happening are slim to none that it's not there, but the chance that it's still a chance in a, in a life-saving instance tells me not to do that. That's why I like my old school irons on pistols. On rifles, um, the, op the, the checkpoints I have or checkboxes I have is it has to have a reticle. It's cool if it lights up. That's awesome. But it has to have one without a light. It has to be able to work without a light. The only compromise is on my wick build. And that's because it was try I tried to stick as close as I could to the movie and they didn't put irons on it. They put a red dot there as a backup. And in reality, what I actually do is I zero my um, my main optic, my 1 to 6 on it, um, from 100 yards out to 500 yards. And I use the red dot, and I zero it at 25 yards so that if I'm using it inside of the house, um, I can use that as a lot simpler, easier way to to steer the rifle, so to speak. But it still gives me that backup because at 25 yards, anyone who knows, or it's actually 27 yards that I, I zero it at, that's what the military uses. Um, it lets me know that if I had to use it, I could use it up to four or 500 meters. There's just going to be a little bit of compensation I'm going to have to do with that dot. To that end, though, I test the hell out of the battery and the mount I have on it. I've tested the hell on it. It is loctited. It is checked. It is as good as I could possibly make it. 
and I would actually stake my life on that rifle and its optics. And that's what I'm willing to do. You know, there's there's a lot of talk you you've seen I've seen friends or had friends that have actually had the um the high point pistol. And you have to have that gentle, loving conversation with them about are you gonna stake your life on this? Because it's a two hundred dollar gun. It's not saying that they don't work. It's saying that the chance of failure with this, because it has a higher failure rate than, say, a Glock or an M&P, um, in that clutch moment, if you actually need it, and that's how I see a pistol, is a pistol is just like having um, a spare tire. Um, you don't use it or a fire extinguisher. You don't need it until you actually need it. Um, are you going to stake your life on it? And that's where I put my stake in the ground. You know, my Glock 19, my most dependable, most reliable, most used um, carry pistol. Um, there's three that I have. Um, that's how redundant I think about things. You know, my Glock 26, same thing. You know, there's tested, ran. Um, my Ruger LCP Max for when I have to carry deep conceal, like going to church um, and not having to print because you want to look nice. Um, I've got a thousand rounds on the thing. There is nothing that I've done to it other than, no, there's nothing I've done to it. It has the original stock sights. It has the tritium vial in the front nose or the front sight. And that's usually how I like them anyway. But I've tested the hell out of them. You know, my Glock 26 has a TLR, I think it's a 7 flashlight or whatever on it, but I change batteries on it on a schedule and check voltage on it. And I don't rely on that because I have a spare uh, flashlight that I carry with me and test daily. Um, because if I need that light, I want something that's going to be there. And there are times that you need a light in general. Um, thank you, Randy, who's a friend of New Mexico Black Rifle Operators Union. He's one of my really good friends. We need to go shooting sometime. He's the one that got me my, my everyday carry, my EDC flashlight. Um, because there's nothing like trying to use a gun light to try to h- highlight something in public. That's something you shouldn't do anyway. Um, so I carry that light with me everywhere I go. And I don't know how many times I've needed inside of a plenum looking for cable in one of the jobs I've had. Or looking for that piece part under a desk when you need a light that's bright enough to do it. I have it. You know, and that's what I'm talking about is the Chinese parts. Do you actually know them? You can see all the reviews on Amazon, um, and most of us really are reluctant to go to something like that anyway because we want American-made parts anyway on this American rifle that we have. Uh, some of us will experiment. We'll try to save money. Uh, rest assured, sometimes it works. Most of the time it don't. And usually you end up buying the more expensive one anyway. Um, I'm also one that doesn't add a lot of things to guns. Um, as weird as that sounds. Uh, if it works, if the intingi- uh, the original design let it run, like the Kalashnikov, I would add something that's super special, super weird. Same with the AR-15. The one exception I can say with the AR-15, and that's because I've actually had this part fail, Um, which is the detent that holds the buffer spring and the buffer itself in place. I've had that detent fail, and I actually had really good parts uh, parts lower for that AR-15. And when it failed, it failed in a spectacular way that brought the gun down. It, It stopped the trigger from actually working. Now, I got it back working pretty quick, but it caused me to have to pop the pins and shake some pieces out so that the gun would actually run. And I was fortunate enough that the gun didn't mash those pieces into the trigger group so that once I shook it, it came right out and I was able to put the buffer spring and buffer back in and go back to shooting that day. But that's always been a thing in my head, so that's why I got a captive buffer. Now with it, um, so far so good. It's all the pieces, parts that it has that could come loose because there are some screws or bolts on it. I made sure that they're Loctited. I clean it and check when I clean my weapon. I check all those pieces. I check the wear pieces. I check the gas rings. This is part of that maintenance schedule that you should do on all your duty guns or your service rifles. Um, That said, I will tell you that I still feel more confident with a Kalashnikov. 
because there is less pieces, parts at the bolt carrier group itself that you have to worry about. Um, especially if you've just shot it and you know the ejection pattern's good and you know that it went click bang every time, um, that will work. In the AR-15, you have the same thing, but then you can take the bolt carrier group, set it on the table, and it collapses when you get home, meaning that it, the gas rings are shot. You know that Will the gun cycle? Yeah. Will it cause malfunctions? Absolutely. And that's where I've noticed the wear and tear on the AR-15. You know, I am still convinced that the American rifle is the AR-15 because there are so many out in play. There's a reason why the American military still uses it, and it's not just because it is um, cheap. Um, it has become increasingly cheaper. That's why I'm kind of what inspired this is that you see some people buying Chinesium bolts, and that's one of those pieces, parts, that's the heart of the gun. You probably want to spend a little money on that that particular part. You know, mounts, eh, test them out, try them out. But if you're going to count on the gun, maybe you shouldn't. Um, because those pieces, parts add up. And what I mean by that is sling mount breaking doesn't sound like a big deal until you're in a fight and you're trying to keep the gun held to you, but the mount broke and now you're having to hold the gun tighter to you or you're having that awesome sling flap behind you because the Chinese Chinesium sling mount that you used broke off or came unattached in the fight. And those are the things I worry about. That's why I roll around and train in the dirt to see what they'll do. And I think the best advice I could give you is if you want to take a risk, that's great. Understand that risk, just like everything else in life, and mitigate it. Test the hell out of what you buy. Like, share, subscribe, most importantly, be great.